So hello folks, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Melina Bondi. I'm here in Tukaranto in Toronto, the traditional territory of Anishinaabe, here on Wendat, Seneca, Anishinaabe, many, many peoples that still live here today. And I get to fill in for Jill this week while she's away on retreat. And so our theme this evening, I thought I would bring in meeting the edge or meeting our edges. Um, and just a little bit more about myself. I've actually known Jill since 2005, I think, maybe even earlier. Uh, we, I lived in Guelph, close to Fergus, and we were both very involved with yoga and dance and Unitarian things. I think I was at the summer camp where her kids went. I was working there and so I met her at some point and our lives just kept overlapping and we both studied with Molly and Norman back in 2009, 10. And then I went off and joined Thich Nhat Hanh's monastery and was a monastic for nine years and have just returned to Canada and to lay life. And I had the chance to do the True North Insight meditation teacher facilitator um, training with Kathy and with Jill teaching it. And so it's been really a joy to reconnect with the TNI community, although now we're online and we're all over the place, but it is also a homecoming for me. So you'll see that I blend Theravada Vipassana insight with some of the Mahayana um, teachings. And if you don't know what those words mean, don't worry. It just means I blend a few traditions. Um, but I always like to name my lineages and my sources. So really honoring both um, through all the teachers who have shared teachings from Thailand, Burma, South, South and Southeast Asia, and then all my teachers through, especially Thich Nhat Hanh, through Vietnam, back to the Chan tradition. And they both, both those lineages go back to the Buddha just in different permutations. So that's a bit about where I'm coming from. See a nod, okay, great. So in that light, um, today's reflection was very much today's reflection for me. I am currently training as a chaplain and in psychotherapy through a program at U of T. So I'm doing a placement at Scarborough General Hospital. I spend three days a week there, I see folks in all sorts of conditions. And I also spend time with my student peers and supervisors. And today we had a multi-faith worship service and there was a reading by Pema Chodron that someone else chose and offered, but it was so good. It really just got me thinking. So I wanted to bring it to this space here tonight and I will put links for everything in the, the recording on YouTube. So don't worry about wondering where to find anything. So I'm just gonna read it. There's a story about a group of people climbing to the top of a mountain. It turns out it's pretty steep. And as soon as they get to a certain height, a couple of people look down and see how far it is and they completely freeze. They come up against their edge and they can't go any further. Other people tripped on ahead laughing and talking, but as the climb continued to get steeper, more people began to get scared and just freeze and stop. All the way up the mountain, there are places where people met their edge and they just couldn't go any further. So in Pema's wisdom, she writes, the moral of the story is that it really doesn't make any difference where you meet your edge. Just meeting it is the point. Life is a whole journey of meeting your edge again and again. That's where you're challenged. That's where, if you're a person who wants to live, you start to ask yourself questions like, now why am I so scared? What is it that I don't wanna see? Why can't I go any further than this? The happy people who got to the top were not the heroes of the day. They just weren't afraid of heights. They're going to meet their edge somewhere else. The ones who froze at the bottom were not the losers. They simply stopped first, so the lesson came earlier than the others. However, sooner or later, everybody meets their own edge. So 
So I like that twist on the common ideas that many of us have that those who get to the top are the winners and that freezing and stopping is a problem, is a loss. You know, we're all gonna reach edges sometimes and I've been reaching a lot of edges in this placement that I told you about. Mostly just my own tiredness of wanting to do a master's degree with basically no academic training, <laughs> having to learn to write papers and get used to, you know, commuting and long days plus schoolwork. And so one of the edges that I reached, especially last December, was I just, I hit a lot of depression. I was trying so used to just pushing through, pushing through. And I thought, well, it's going to be hard, but I'll just, I'll just keep pushing through. <laughs> I won't freeze. I'll keep going. I'll make it through somehow. And then I had just hit this deep collapse and I was so exhausted, but I couldn't sleep because I was on this treadmill, this inner go, go, go. You know, like even three weeks into the winter break, I, uh, I still couldn't sleep for more than like four or five hours a night and I was exhausted. My body was just completely out of whack. And this is a really deep edge that I hit. And I was trying to fight it or like trying to fix it by myself. And one of the most important things that that edge brought me to was realizing I needed to ask for help in a different way. And for the first time in my life, I talked to my doctor and I got sleeping pills. Um, which I've never taken before. And uh, within a few days, I was sleeping for at least six hours and everything felt better and different, <laughs> but it required this surrendering. And I'm someone who has deeply resisted any types of Western pharmaceuticals my whole life. When I had cancer, I wouldn't do chemotherapy. I did surgery, but like, it's like, nope, I, I have some really deep reservations. So it was to get to a point where I was like, yeah, give me the pills was a huge change for me. That sometimes our edges bring us to really important surrender change. Oh, wait a minute. What if I stop fighting it the way I'm used to and just see this is how it is right now. And in our lives and our practices, we're always being invited to resist less <laughs> and meet things as they are. And we may <laughs> freeze at the very first precipice of the mountain journey that we happen to be on. And that's how it is. We don't need to pretend to have no fear of heights. We also may have no fear of heights and we don't need to pretend that we have no fear of anything else or no other edges or limits. And there's something in this inner, this inner state for me, it's like, it's this softening but it's not a running away from. That's this dance that we're playing as we learn to be more and more attuned, show up with a little more authenticity and vulnerability and, and clarity and resolve. It actually, it, it took a deep commitment to honesty for myself, to, I was gonna say call it my doctor. No, to book an online appointment <laughs> because that's the time that we're in. Um, yeah, I had to actually just go, wait a minute, what's, what's actually needed now? Not in the version where I can just change everything and start getting more sleep through different ways. How is it now? And what conditions do I have possibility to change? And I knew my placement would be going on for a few more months and that I wasn't likely to make any drastic changes if even three weeks of school break wasn't enough to reset my system. And I think oftentimes our spiritual teachings can show, point us to these beautiful lofty heights of possibility that is so beautiful and so important. But when we start thinking that that's how it's supposed to be, that we have to pretend that we aren't as we are here and now in the messiness, um, then we actually get very, very turned around. And that's so much of, of the freedom that the Dharma points to 
begins with the non-resistance of the pain or the frustration or the disappointment. And that's where the freedom comes from, not from never meeting the pain or the freeze or the fear or the disappointment. And it made me think a lot of this tiny little sutta that I really love. I imagine Jill might have shared it at some point. It's the Ogatara Na Sutta, crossing the flood. And this translation from Bhikkhu Bodhi is what I'll use and share in the notes. So crossing the flood is the beginning of the Sutta Nipata, the numerical discourses. So it starts the way they traditionally start. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati and Jetta's Grove, Anattapindika's Park. Then when the night had advanced, a certain devata of stunning beauty, illuminating the entire Jetta's Grove, approached the Blessed One. Having approached, he paid homage to the Buddha, stood to one side and said, Oh, dear sir, did you cross the flood? And the Buddha said, by not halting, friend, and by not straining, I crossed the flood. But how is it, dear sir, that by not halting and by not straining, you crossed the flood? And the Buddha said, when I came to a standstill, friend, then I sank. But when I struggled, then I got swept away. It is in this way, friend, that by not halting and by not straining, I crossed the flood. The Devata said, after a long time at last, I see a Brahmin who is fully quenched, who by not halting, not straining, has crossed over attachment to the world. This is what the Devata said. The teacher approved. Then the Devata, thinking the teacher has approved of me, paid homage to the Buddha and keeping him to the right, disappeared right there. So that's the whole sutta. It's short and sweet. And for those of you, I don't know if any of you are unfamiliar, but Devata or Deva is the name of a celestial being or the generic name of celestial beings. And in part, I, I like sharing this one because often in insight spaces, we share a very sort of non-religious, non-esoteric interpretation of Dhamma. But if we go back to the suttas, there are stories of beings of other planes all over the place. Um, and it doesn't need doesn't mean that you have to believe or disbelieve in them, <laughs> but, but they are there. Um, you know, the Buddha was radical enough to question the existence of a soul, of a an long term enduring self, and uh, sort of denounced the there being a a central deity. And yet he also spent a lot of time talking <laughs> to minor celestial deities. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, you know, it was, it was a Brahma God who invited the Buddha after his awakening to say, please come teach. And the Buddha said, I don't know if anyone's going to understand. And it was this Brahma celestial being who kept saying, but please, please, please come teach. And finally the Buddha said, yes. So um, that's a little bit of, of the context of this. So it said that it was, a, it was a celestial being who asked this question, but it could, you know, it could be a human, it could be a celestial being, it could be uh, all sorts of beings, but this question is really, really powerful. How did you cross the flood? That's the metaphor for how did you free yourself from suffering? Because the floods of life is one of the metaphors for dukkha, for what we translate as suffering, but it can mean dissatisfaction, uh, the not perfectness of life. And so the Buddha saying, by this is how he freed himself from the inner turmoil of suffering by not halting and by not straining, 
by not stopping and by not rushing is another way of, of translating these words. And part of what I enjoy is the physicality of it. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to cross a flood, a, a flooded stream or any stream and imagine yourself in bare feet as the Buddha would be. If you take a few steps and you stop, you're, you're gonna sink in mud, it just sucks you in. And if you try to go too fast, imagine your feet on slippery stones, like that's dangerous. But if you, you know, you feel your way, you find where it's steady. Okay, next step, and just the next step, one footstep at a time, you can make your way across, which is what the Dhamma is always inviting us into. <laughs> one breath, one step here and now, What's the next right thing? What's the next needed thing? What's the edge right now? And I know I'm mixing some metaphors because in Pema's story, she talked about people meeting their edge and freezing, which is a kind of stopping. Um, so please forgive the mixed metaphors. I hope that it's not too confusing or problematic. Um, but this, this how to continue even how to, how to meet the edge and maybe not continue up the mountain, but realize, okay, this is my edge and not pushing through it, but also not completely collapsing and giving up going, oh, well, it's too hard. I have an edge. I guess I'm a failure. <laughs> There's something wrong with me. No, everyone has an edge. At some point we're going to, we're going to meet them. And how do we work with the edge as opposed to trying to pretend that there is no edge or go, well, oh, oh no, it's just, it's all ruined. There's no hope for anything that, that uh, the extremism most of us will meet in our daily lives as well as in our formal practice. Oh, I'm tired today. I just can't practice as opposed to, wow, what's it like to practice with a lot of tiredness? And so that may be crossing the flood of tiredness. You go even slower and even more gently, but you don't have to stop. You don't have to avoid or so I just can't practice. I didn't realize I had signed up for a retreat a few years ago that involved three days of not sleeping. And I was really horrified when I got there. And obviously I didn't have to do it, but the teacher was, you know, really encouraging and I was like fine I'll try it because I'd heard of this kind of tiger practice they call it it's fairly traditional in a lot of um, certainly in Thailand and Burma I hadn't thought I would explore it then but there I was and there's nothing like not sleeping for a few days I think I did kind of doze off for 20 minutes here and there a few times um, to keep feeling these and hearing these voices inside of, I just can't I cannot continue, but I, I couldn't continue with this kind of energy when I really let those voices saying, okay, there's some, there's some panic going on. There's some tremendous frustration. There's a, how on earth did they not tell me this before signing up? Like problematic ethics of their communication, <laughs> but here I am right now, right now, what's real? What's, what's possible? Thinking about the future or the, like the three days of not sleeping was too much, but one breath of exhaustion, I actually could stay present with. And one step of tiredness that was kind of woozy and leaning against the wall, if I tightened and tried to force through it, it just would be really painful. I got so angry and upset but that softening into okay it's like this exhaustion i get to understand exhaustion deeply right now and it was a chance to actually break through if we will some of the ideas i had about oh well if i'm really exhausted i just can't practice no actually one can practice with exhaustion it just has to be gentler neither stopping and sinking in the mud nor 
racing and going too fast over those slippery stones. So I have great love for that sutta and I've played with it in many, many ways. Time is going on faster than I thought it would, which often happens. So I just want to close with a poem before we move into some formal practice. I had brought in two, not sure which one was going to was going to fit more. Okay, Zen Ju Earthland Manuel, um, an amazing Zen teacher, um, California often, sometimes other places. Um, who has written beautifully around like identity and gender and sexuality and race and dharma and um, then she put out this lovely book called the deepest peace more poetry and um, meditative passages essays I guess and so this is a small passage from one called uh, quietly undone so she writes we are to be undone this is life, there's no getting around it. We unravel over and over again, life gets disrupted. We are thrown off. We face the unimaginable, it's sobering, ending up in a place that we thought we'd never be. In that strange place, we are quietly undone. We're not who we thought we were. We burn away. And then immediately we want to sweep up the ashes or whittle and sand the charred pieces off to make a smooth mound of life. Mount that if breathed upon would come undone again. Only when we've come undone can we truly understand. Know, love and awaken. But quietly undone also that coming to the edge but being undone is, does not mean that we have to stop nor rush through it it's just how it goes so i'd like to invite us into some formal practice you may meet moments of feeling undone you may not but if it happens, know that it's it's not a problem. It's not uh, an exception to the rule. It is how it goes. So please choose a posture that feels supportive, whether that's sitting, standing, lying down, cameras on or off. And one of the things that can help both when there is a sense of stability and when there's a sense of everything falling apart is connecting to the ground, feeling the touch points, your body meets a steady surface, our gravity does its beautiful work of holding us in place rather than flying off into outer space. In any place we feel gravity, it is the earth holding us. Even if we're used to holding ourselves up all the time, rushing through, afraid of sinking if we ever stop. But right now we get to stop and let these earth bodies be held by the great earth. It's helpful taking a few full breaths to remind our bodies what full breaths feel like. Breathing in the air, breathing in the sky.
And every moment we are held by the earth, breathing the sky, breathing the air that connects us all, the air breathed by the Buddha, by all our ancestors, by our descendants will be breathed. Held by the earth, that held all our ancestors, spiritual and genetic. Our ancestors, the, the primates, all the way back to zooplankton, can go all the way back to the stars where we truly are stardust. the whole cosmos as ancestors. And in this vastness, resting into the particularity of here and now. Whatever sensations are present, it's how it is. And it's changing. Whatever emotions and thoughts are present, that's how it is. And it's changing. So if there's an anchor you're used to working with, resting in breath or touch points or perhaps sounds that arise and pass, you're welcome to amble towards your anchor, not, not grasping onto it, not forcing attention to concentrate tightly, but rather just letting the, the pulp swirling around in the cup of apple juice that may be our minds today and just by giving this rest, letting these bodies be held by earth, bit by bit, the pulp will settle. Getting attuned with that patience of what is the appropriate speed needed to meet this moment and the next to Cross the floods, even if it's small, the, the small floods or the big floods. Eating however it is right now with the patience and persistence, crossing a flooded stream slowly and steadily, returning to the anchor. Without needing to pretend needing to fool ourselves into or forcing ourselves into a, a perfection that doesn't exist.
here and now, held by the earth, breathing the sky. Allowing attention to collect, to savor, right here and now. This is the kind of concentration we cultivate, not the, the tight, forced, one-pointedness, but the, the deliciousness of savoring a pleasant, ice cream cone. That's actually how teacher described it once. Can we find a way to meet the, the okayness, <laughs> the enoughness of here and now? that attention wants to stay present? Can we be a little more interested in the touch points and the sounds arising and fading away and breath coming in and out of the body? And when we feel like we're coming to an edge, an emotion that feels too difficult, a sensation that feels overwhelming, even a, a distractedness that just feels too frustrating to bear, this too, this too is part of the practice. No one wins or loses for following more breaths in a row than anyone else. held by the earth, breathing the sky. Finding just enough effort. To be present with awareness, nothing extra, no rushing. So we don't stumble not turning the lute string too tight, as another sutta says, nor letting the lute string get too loose or, or just collapsing into the mud and getting stuck.
We meet our edges, we may feel we are coming undone. But that's the gift, not the problem. So we'll continue in silence for most of the rest of the next 10 minutes. held by the earth breathing the sky. Meeting this moment. Without rushing to the next or getting stuck in the last one. Returning to now. And now. And now,
held by the earth breathing the sky. Eating now, again and again. As we near the close of this formal practice time, I will share this poem by Richard Wagamese from his book, Embers. It speaks to the kind of understanding we cultivate in the Dhamma. He writes, I know mountains because I have stood on precipices and breathed. I know prairie because I have lain on my back and been absorbed by the sky. I know the ocean because I have immersed myself in it and felt the pull of its current. If I want to know life, I need to experience its wonder and breathe it in with every breath. If I want to know possibility, I need to see its immensity and allow it to absorb me. If I want to know faith, I need to surrender to it and feel it pulling me in its unseen direction. for participating in this practice. I'm going to stop the recording.